Hi, everyone. And uh, my name is Randy Weingarten. And I'm going to take my mask off now. But you know, when we're inside, we should all be wearing one. But right now, I'm physically distant. Um, and in some ways, very distant from all the panelists that I'm about to introduce. We have five people on this panel. We were supposed to have a sixth person on this panel. But this is what happens in the lives of AFT nurses and AFT healthcare professionals. Uh, Obina Okunoko was supposed to be on our panel, um, but he has um, been pulled off to do a last minute overtime shift. And um, that's the case of so many of our healthcare professionals and our nurses right now. So what I wanted to do first is say thank you that you're all here, but to get into the conversation by asking you briefly one thing about COVID and about the crisis that frankly surprised you. You know, something that our members all throughout the country who are watching this, that they may not know about, like just one thing, top of the mind, what surprised you about all of this? Good, bad, and different? What, or, you know, just something that we might not even know. So why don't we start with Julia? Great. Um, well, I think as an ICU nurse, the thing that shocked me and a lot of my colleagues is how quickly people that come in go from just having a cough, some fever, to within three to four hours in front of your eyes need to be on a ventilator. And once in a blue moon as an ICU nurse, you'll see that. But they're usually very chronically ill people that you've dealt with before. These are many of them healthy people. And you'll be talking to them and have just admitted them and have to call for help to intubate them and put them on a ventilator. And that's like nothing in my 25 years of nursing experience that I've come across time and time and time again. And that is a very scary thing that um, we were just inundated with and are still inundated with. Thank you, Julia. Um, Jax, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm a progressive care nurse. So we uh, handle the COVID patients until they go get intubated with Julia. Um, <laughs> I, what surprised me the most, I think, is how the hospital handled COVID because, you know, like we're told to wear masks and all stay six feet apart and social distancing and all that. But if you come into the hospital, we may or may not test you for COVID. And we might put you in a shared room where you're literally three feet from another person with only a curtain to separate you. And all the rules that have been suggested go out the window when you go into a hospital, it just seems odd. And part of it is, you know, look at what's happening right now, where even in places where you actually have some tests, it takes what, a week to get the test results back? So how can you actually do, two weeks, how can you actually do testing and tracing? And, and isol how can you do tracing and isolation in a situation like that? Nora, what, what surprised you in this moment? As nurses, I, we were frightened and felt betrayed um, that our management didn't have our back, that CDC, the DOH were lowering their guidelines to match our supply versus maintaining our guidelines and trying their best to enhance our supply. Um, so so from, from that, from a work standpoint, that was, that was very frightening, that we just felt helpless. Um, but physically, the chest x-ray on these patients literally looked like somebody crumpled gla crushed glass and sprinkled it in the lungs. So to see that what what would appear to any healthcare worker irreversible damage you know to see that and know that it was so helpless for so many people to actually be able to recover from this 
was, it was very, very disturbing and heartbreaking because I never saw an x-ray book anything like that before. So again, it was wow. a, lot, a lot of different things, you know, really wow. hit up. But those, those two stand out, you know, like thinking that, you know, because again, with, with uh, H1N1, when that came out, you know, it seemed like we had supplies to the hilt. You know, we were wearing like moon, moon suits, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when this came about, they are like, oh, sorry, here's your N95 for the month. What? <laughs> you know, when it says right, right on the box, one time use only. Right. So. And, and, you know, not to be political, but it was a different federal administration with H1N1. Right. It was a right. different federal administration with Ebola. And, you know, there was a lot more um, coordination about what was needed and getting it to people, um, you know, as quickly as possible. Um, so, Jacinta, what surprised you? Different is we were told you had to have, um, you had other things that comorbidities. And what was the aha moment for most of the nurses in my area, because we're in a rural area, is these were 25 and 30 year old people. And they were walking and yes, they needed oxygen, but in a day or two, they were on a ventilator because they didn't, their oxygen kept dropping and there was nothing you could do about it. But as we're now in an area where kids are getting together because they thought things were opening and now we have high school students that tested positive with football and they just had a party with kids and they have a lot of those have come back tested positive. So people are not taking it serious. They yeah. just, you know, they're in my area, they think wearing a mask is violating your rights. And it, all it is is a safety mechanism, but we know that, but you find yourself really, really defending yourself to people that should know better. And it, again, it you know, that it starts from the top in terms of what Trump it, has done. It does. And yep. you know, the, the panic, you know, first you see one or two cases, but as we a small hospital, we're seeing where we might have 10 beds and out of the 10 people you have here, five of them are positive and they're on ventilators. So you're, you're seeing us pick up more shift. We're tired, but it just can't just turn your back on it because this is what we do. We take care of patients that need us. Crystal, what, what either surprised you or was just different and that you didn't expect? Well, I know when it first happened here in Baltimore County, when the groundswell started um, going on about coronavirus, um, I was one of maybe a handful of people that volunteered to take this project on. Um, we didn't get a lot of information. We didn't know exactly what coronavirus was. And what really surprised me was the amount of gratitude that people would come and they would roll down their windows. They would be incredibly frightened and they would say, thank you. And there were days where I would get a full night's sleep and wake up emotionally exhausted because I didn't want to go to work because I'm tired of COVID. But when you get that thank you, it gave you the energy you needed to push through that day and to get up and do it all over again the next day. The the energy, the emotional, um, the emotions, it's, it's just remarkable. It's so awesome. Um, I know I started by talking about how, you know, we're on the front lines, we're trying to fight for safety, we're trying to do these things. But this fight became really personal. Um, for me, there was a conversation I had 
with the leaders of about 40 of our healthcare locals. Um, but the one common thread other than the anxiety and the magnitude of what we were facing and you were facing on the front lines, the one common thread was the absence of PPE. We kept on hearing, we don't have enough. And, and given this virus, we need personal protective equipment. And so we did what, you know, unions do best. And, and, and if you ask me, I have never been a supply clerk before in my life. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have known how to fill out a procurement piece of paper. Mm -hmm. and, and we said, you know, we're not going to wait for philanthropy or for the Congress to do something. We just went into the AFT budget and spent about $3 million securing, we got 50,000 face shields, we got 1 million surgical masks, um, we have the N95, some of which have come already, some of which are still in, you know, which we've paid for, still in some warehouses that we can't get yet. Yeah. And we'll do it again. But, but tell me, I know, Nora, some of the, and I know some of the um, folks in um, PEF and in UUP, um, both of whom are part of the um, state, the New York State um, uh, Medical Center hospital system up upstate and Stony Brook and downstate. Um, and that's, and, and you are so pivotal at, at Stony Brook. So what, you know, what did it mean? Like what, what, what did it, like what did you think when you initially heard Okay, so Randy's going to look for PPE, but but then <laughs> what, what did you think when we found it and we got it and we, you know, when, when they landed at JFK, I like, I was so excited. Oh my God, it's on a plane. Oh my God, it landed from JFK. Oh my God, get it in the truck so nobody takes it. But what did you think? <laughs> no, it, it, was, it was a great sense of relief. You know, I mean, the, f the first time I got an SOS call was the last weekend in March, where a nurse in the emergency room called and said, we have no more small N95s. They're telling us to wear a bandana. It was a feeling of relief. And they're like, wow, I can't believe a union is do our union's doing that. And I can't tell you how many times that I kind of did that little, and that's why we have a union. <laughs> and, and like the light bulbs went on, like, ah. <laughs> But again, just knowing that, you know, there was going to be relief. And I know my brothers and sisters, particularly at SUNY Downstate, who, um, you know, received, you know, a good bulk of those, um, those masks and, and, and shields and things of that nature, um, you know, were just so alleviated because, I, again, this was around the time the garbage bags were being worn and one of, you know, the uh, nurse managers wound up um, passing away, a young fellow. Um, so again, it really, you know, it really made us feel like we were cared about because, you know, so much with the rules changing on a constant basis and our managers telling us in emails that we're just going to consider everybody with COVID. So just wear a surgical mask. What? <laughs> you, know, um, you know, to know that it seemed like you guys had our back, <laughs> whereas our managers, we felt really, we lost our faith in our management. You know, so it was, it was, it was uh, timely and wonderful. And, you know, this is, I think it's put a renewed faith in unions as well, because a lot of people, again, if you don't use it, it doesn't mean much to you type of thing, you know. Um, but if, if, if the union is, is, you know, overwhelmingly obviously helping you, they have no choice but to understand what unionism is. And I, I think it was, it was a, Again, it's a terrible thing, a pandemic, but I think it was a nice wake up call and a refreshing, you know, outlook for people um, as far as unions go. So thank Great. you. Thank you yeah. so much. Great. But that gets me to the, the last question that I want to just um, ask Crystal about, which is this. So what do we do about this on a national level? Like, would it matter? Um, if there was a different president? 
Well, first of all, absolutely. I think this president has left the whole medical community, the frontline workers um, in particular, disheartened and demoralized to sit and watch a president divide us as a nation during a time when he should be bringing us together, um, basically by willfully, and, and I'm not sure if the, it's not a measured and concerted effort to disregard top public health officials like Dr. Fauci and scientific evidence that proves that just by wearing a mask, you can curtail the transmission of this virus. Um, I think a different administration would definitely prove to be a benefit to all of us because they would be bringing us together. They would be looking at the scientific data and encouraging people to wear a mask. I mean, this president has basically made, and I have one handy here because I just did my laundry, a mask as a political statement. So now you're on one side or another based upon whether or not you wear a mask. And that should never be the case. We should, the most patriotic thing that anybody could do at this very moment is wear a mask. I'm not wearing this mask for me. I'm wearing this mask for someone else. And someone else would be doing the same for me. Yep. That is what we need right now. We need a leader that's not afraid to listen to people who are smarter than him and to go by scientific evidence that says, wear your mask wash your hands stay six feet apart from people if you are physically able if not make sure you have your mask on that's what we need right now you know one of the things you just said crystal is about you know we've we've referred to dr fauci but we will be um blessed to actually hear what he has to say because tonight um we are having dr fauci at a town hall at 6.45 Eastern time tonight. Um, any of our members want to um, link to Facebook Live, we're going to have Dr. Fauci on um, to really answer our questions. And I've been studying up to, you know, because I'm really nervous about making sure I ask the right questions. And so he will be with us tonight, and not just for our convention delegates, but all of our members. And I'd like to at this moment, just um, end today with um, looking at one other of our amazing heroes, Trung Lee, a nurse from Connecticut. And just as we end, take out your handkerchief um, and listen to um, Trung's story. Thank you, all of you. I so appreciate you and, I, and we all all of our members just are so grateful and so thank thankful you randy thank, thank you, thank you for all you do thanks randy thank you we appreciate you